I'm Stuart Phillipson, and I'm from the University of Manchester, so I figure we might as well get started. Supposedly, what I'm going to do is explain um, what Matterhorn is to you guys, but I, I guess I'd just like to get an impression for how familiar you are with the uh, project already. So have any of you used Matterhorn already, if you just stick your hands in the air? Uh, a few. Um, have any of you worked in open source communities before? A few. Okay, right. So I'll, I'll use all the slides that I brought with me then. Um, so the reason why I sort of volunteered to give this presentation is um, I was a completely new user to Matterhorn just over a year ago. Um, we decided to use it for a Let's Capture deployment. So you can still think of me as a somewhat new adopter to, uh, to, to the software. Um, so uh, I'm going to do the first part of this presentation where I'm going to show some slides and explain what Matterhorn is. And then we're going to do something risky, a live software demonstration, which will be done by my colleague James Perrin, where we're just going to throw up a, a Matterhorn VM and, uh, and then you know, kind of show you how it works. Um, so I, I'm going to explain this three times because we see this question come onto list quite a few times. So uh, trying to explain what Matterhorn is. So um, uh, what I wanted to do and why I got involved with Matterhorn is um, we had lecture theatres in which people give presentations like this, and I wanted students to be able to download them offline later on and, and watch them. Um, so uh, Matterhorn provides us with the ability to do this. So um, uh, I think uh, this gets termed as lecture capture most commonly. I unfortunately interchanged that with the phrase podcast because that's what we call it at my institution. But um, some of the defining features of Matterhorn is that it allows you to uh, uh, schedule a lecture. Uh, it then allows you to, to capture a lecture, to, to produce a recording of it. It handles the processing, management, and distribution of those lectures. And uh, one of its defining principles is its FOSS, so it's free open source software, which makes it somewhat different from the... Um, from the other offerings on the market. Um, I'm not really going to cover the history of Matterhorn because I came into the project far too late from that. But, but one of the uh, things that inspired people to create Matterhorn in the first instance was that there were no kind of alternatives to the large proprietary solutions that, that are available out there, particularly nothing that was uh, free and open source. And lecture capture um, uh, can be an expensive business. I'm, I'm going to do a talk later on about financing lecture capture, but um, that's why free and open source software is so um, important. So I'll try and explain what I just explained again, but in a different way. So um, people seem to get confused sometimes about what Matterhorn really is or what services it provides. So, so to put it very basically, it provides the, uh, the, the capture of recordings. So um, Matterhorn gives you the option to get generic off-the-shelf hardware. So this is a, a, an old Dell PC with a, with a capture device. It, uh, Matterhorn is a software application that runs on that and can uh, provide you with the ability to make lecture recordings. Matterhorn is also an application that runs at the back end, so it provides you with the processing and management of those recordings. So it's quite powerful because it's got modular architecture, which means you can create clusters of Matterhorn servers that allow you to take these raw recordings from the lecture theatre and process them into usable formats and then kind of distribute them in a controlled, uh, orchestrated manner. Um, so I've got this last area which shows um, uh, a slide that I've stolen from ETH Zurich where it's, uh, it's showing someone that's given a lecture and this is being processed by Matterhorn and this is being distributed through the Engage UI which is Matterhorn's distribution system. So this is sort of the same slide again where um, uh, Matterhorn is modular. So uh, to explain what I mean by that is uh, to get a lecture from a theatre like this recorded and into the hands of a student, you usually need several components. So, so in this, I've, I've just uh, illustrated a few of them. You'll need some storage, processing, a streaming server, a web server for downloads, something to, to manage all these different servers, a database, a, a unit to do the recordings, um, and an FTP server to take those files in in turn. Um, so you might think of them as kind of um, building blocks. And one of the great things about Matterhorn is you don't have to use all the building blocks that come with Matterhorn. So you might have one that you want to change. Um, so a good example of this would be, uh, would be my institution. So um, at my institution, uh, uh, well, Matterhorn ships with a, with a streaming server built in, an open source free streaming server that's called Red5. Um, however, uh, the staff at my institution are not experienced with Red5. They, they, they don't know how to work it. But lucky old us, um, Matterhorn, uh, we can strip out that element of Matterhorn and use something else. So my staff are trained with Wowser. So for our Matterhorn instance, we'll be using Wowser to deliver our streams rather than the inbuilt Red5. So we've just replaced one subcomponent of it. It's kind of similar with the, with, the, with the database. So Matterhorn ships with MySQL, which isn't really supported by my host institution. So we've chosen to run Matterhorn talking to a Microsoft SQL server. So again, we've done an integration, and rather than use the default, we've stripped out that module and changed it with something that works a little bit better for us. We're still using the same processing architecture and the same Matterhorn core, but just talking to different elements of the system. Um, 
very critically, and something I'm a big fan of, is, is kind of the same with the capture agent. So the capture agent is the box that you install in the theater that does the recordings. We, we, we have our, our vended box here. And um, so Matterhorn has a software application that will turn a generic PC into a capture agent. And um, we've chosen not to use that. So there's, there's, you'll see from the stands outside that there's lots of vendors, such as NCAST. They make a Matterhorn-compatible box that you can buy off the shelf and use instead of the default capture agent. Similarly, there's Epifan that have their own box. There's also Galacaster, which I'm a huge fan of, um, and that's what we're using in our deployment. And there's, there's, there's many others. I won't list them all, but basically there's, there's vended solutions for the capture agent in the same way that there's vended solutions for the database. So you can replace different elements and customize Matterhorn down to um, the, the needs of your institution. And I think that's, um, that's uh, why Matterhorn's of interest to us. So uh, I've been asked the question previously, why would you choose Matterhorn over, say, any other lecture capture solution? And there's a few reasons. The, the primary reason why we chose Matterhorn was um, we actually already knew what our users wanted from a lecture capture system. So we, we went and we talked to our academics and our students, and we had a list of key requirements. So rather than just getting a bunch of features and deploying the software and seeing what it did, we knew that the software had to meet certain demands. And when we went to talk to some of the vended solutions, uh, such as Echo360 and Panopto and MediaSite, we, we were not wholly convinced that we would be able to customize their software to meet these requirements. We would have had to make compromises we were unwilling to do. But fortunately, because Matterhorn is customizable, we were able to achieve those. Um, secondarily, it is cost. So cost is definitely a motivator when it comes to lecture capture. Lecture capture is an expensive business. And we found that Matterhorn looked to be the most cost-effective uh, method of, uh, of achieving lecture capture on a large scale. Some of the other reasons which come to play are, are largely because it has a flexible open architecture. Because we can actually get at the source code and see how it works underneath, we can make changes that you wouldn't be able to make normally in another system. Uh, there's options for customization, so you can integrate it with other systems in ways that you might not necessarily expect. So we're, we're doing an integration between Matterhorn and our timetabling system so that we can uh, automate more processes than we would be able to do otherwise. Uh, an interesting one is its ability to replace other systems. And lastly, um, my experience of OpenCast Matterhorn is that the, uh, the people that are using the software and kind of directing the innovation, they're often sat right next to the developers who are creating these solutions. So you tend to end up with something that's a very short hop from the people who are driving features and driving innovation to the people that are delivering those features and delivering those innovations. Um, so I've got some slides. I don't know how, how accurate a portrayal this is, but um, my institution hasn't really engaged with open source communities uh, often before. So this is something new for us. So uh, I feel obliged to explain what it's like to work in an open source community, um, because it was something of a change for me. And you know, I'm sorry if you're already aware of this, but uh, I'll explain it anyway. So, Normally that you have individuals and they work, at, uh, they work at institutions and they'll find a software solution, so a lecture capture solution. And, and you can procure that and then, then deploy it at your solution. Um, software solutions are inevitably made by some company and uh, that company usually has a bunch of developers who, who in turn develop the software solution you might buy. Um, the people that procure these solutions and use them are kind of different from the companies that provide them. So they're usually a, a wider community of users. And uh, I've often found that the wider community of users, particularly in higher education, are, are the people that are driving the innovation behind the software. They're, they'll take this software solution and use it in ways that the company's never expected and demand changes far more rapidly than they're usually prepared to do. And that can lead to a kind of a source of friction. So when you want a change made to a software solution, and um, software solutions I've worked in the past, I've put in RFCs, requests for change. I've asked them to, to customize the software in a particular way. And uh, occasionally that can work out well. So if, if the rest of the community are interested in that solution being changed in a certain way, then it's in the interests of the company to, to, to do that. So they might make your customization. So they'll supply some dev time, they'll customize the solution, and that's great. The real problem arises when it's just your institution that wants a change. So if just the University of Manchester wants Syllabus Plus integration, this huge company isn't going to turn around and do it unless the rest of the, uh, rest of the people they're selling to uh, are interested in that. And then that kind of means that you don't get your software change, which is unfortunate because your need for it doesn't really go away. Um, and you're not going to get the dev time, and then this is problematic. And I've had various excuses like this in the past. So people saying, put in a feature request, or it's planned for a future version, or the platform that you're using is not supported. Um, yeah, it's very frustrating. Um, so to briefly explain how working in an open source community is a bit different from this, is uh, you still have people working at institutions. You still have a software solution. Um, in this model, there's still other people that work on that software solution. There's still, uh, still companies. And they themselves form this wider community of users. Um, you still have devs, and they can be at both, uh, both companies and, uh, and institutions and at host institutions. 
and devs do what developers do, which is provide software solutions. So they, they, they generate code which produces software. Uh, the bit where it gets interesting is um, uh, once you've procured some open source software or you've implemented it and you decide you want to change that software in some fundal, fundamental way that you, that you feel you'll meet the needs of your users, well, you can, you can just do that. So you can, you can download a code branch of Matterhorn. You can customize a local version. If you spend long enough working on the software solution, you can eventually commit code back. So you've got this option to take, take the software and fundamentally change its functionality. Um, this has a few requirements. So um, for me to make changes to Matterhorn, I'm not a developer and I've never written a line of code for it in my life. So uh, I've had to recruit a development resource that's hosted at my university. Um, you might not be able to do that. Um, so uh, you might recruit um, a company that would do the development on your, uh, your behalf. So uh, Tobias, who's at this conference, he represents a company called Entwine. We've contracted them repeatedly to do software development on our behalf. So even though we have a local development resource, sometimes we'll do something that's so complicated or desire a change that's beyond our means. And we've contracted that work out for others. And the great result of both of those, either doing it yourself or contracting this work out, is that we get a customization to the software that we need in order to fill, fulfill our institutional requirements. Um, so this wider community of innovators, that's the OpenCast community, and the software solution that they've produced is called OpenCast Matterhorn. Um, so I'll just quickly rattle through a couple of slides that explain this in a more practical sense. So um, this is Jira, where uh, you can download the, the Matterhorn code for compile it and run it. And it shows activity streams of what people are doing, the changes that they're making to the code. Maybe they're providing bug fixes um, at appropriate times. Maybe they're providing new features. Um, and here's an example of a, of a bug that we found in Matterhorn. So we found that um, uh, you were unable to schedule a recording in IE9 in the latest version of Matterhorn, which is quite problematic. And uh, this is where kind of the difference between maybe how Matterhorn works and maybe how a proprietary source would work. So um, if I was a company that wholly owned this software and maybe I wasn't interested in supporting IE9, maybe I think Internet Explorer is the devil and you know, I can just say that that's not a supported platform and walk away from it. But for Manchester, it's important to support IE because a lot of our users use it, even though it's really annoying. So as you can see in, uh, in here, it's listed as a critical bug because we thought it was quite important. But you can also see that it's been resolved. So um, James uh, spent some time, wrote some code, committed a patch, and now you can schedule recordings in IE9. So we've directly changed the code of Matterhorn to more closely meet the needs of our users. This one's a little more difficult to explain. I won't go into the, the nature of the bug, but this was too technically challenging, I'll say, because we're quite new users to the Matterhorn community. So what we did was we contracted Entwine to fix this bug on our behalf. Um, so you can see it's been fixed by Lucas Rona um, uh, and uh, uh, that, it's, uh, that it's been resolved. So we've identified a bug that was beyond our means to fix, fix but yet still managed to, to fix that code within Matterhorn. Um, as I mentioned before, one of the wonderful things about it as well is Matterhorn's capacity to replace existing systems, and that's largely down to um, customization. So um, for the previous year, we were using Podcast Producer 2. Um, unfortunately, I'm not sure if you're aware, but Apple pulled this software. So in 10.6, we could do all kinds of crazy stuff like schedule recordings, um, have very sophisticated workflows, have the entire service centralized, but then they binned off the X server and they got pretty much rid of Podcast Producer. So we had this terrible hardware situation where we didn't have server-grade management. We couldn't remotely turn off and on the servers when they crashed. So it was a very painful place to be in. Here's an example of a Podcast Producer 2 feed. So these are, these are individual video and audio recordings of lectures. And we knew that we desperately needed to replace this piece of software. And what's happened in the past when we've replaced software of this kind of scale is uh, an enormous amount of friction with our users. So it's pretty common to say, we're replacing the software. You're now going to have to go on a three-hour training course to learn the new bit of software. And that applies to both staff and students. And it's a really unpleasant thing to have to do. Um, this is our Matterhorn-based uh, uh, RSS feed being fed into iTunes uh, today. So these courses were, were a year apart, and they're pretty much identical. The, the end result to the students is so similar that we haven't even had to rewrite our instructions. And over the winter period, we entirely replaced every single element of the podcast producer system. So every capture agent, every database, every web server, every physical server, and the delivery mechanism all was removed, gutted, and then replaced by a Matterhorn-based system. And the users have no idea that we did it. And it's quite magical. So we now have this clustered, supported, customizable service that we didn't have access to before. And we've managed to do it entirely without the users being aware. So we can now move from this platform of instability to a platform of stability. And we were only really be, we were only able to achieve this because we could customize, the, we, we knew the user requirement already and we bespoke Matterhorn down to it. 
Um, I always feel obliged to show a few UI shots, although you'll see some more of this in a second when James does a Matterhorn installation. But um, this is our Matterhorn installation up and running. So you have a UI. These are lists of recordings that we're do doing during a semester. So this is a single day, and there's about 40 recordings during that day. It shows the dates to and from when they are, and these have all finished processing. Um, if you click play, it takes you out to the, the, the CMS environment, which uh, looks like this. And this illustrates some of the more sophisticated features of Matterhorn. So this is a, a dual screen video. Uh, at Manchester, we, um, this is why I stole this slide from ETH. Um, at Manchester, we just do a projector casting. So you only see the PowerPoint. But at ETH, they're doing dual screen video. And um, you have player controls down here. So you can independently control these two streams, deciding on what content's relevant to you, enlarge the PowerPoint, make the presenter video smaller. There's also sophisticated elements within here where there's segmentation analysis, where it's detected uh, changes in slides as the talk's been given. And you can see this reflected in this shot where um, not only have you got segmentation analysis, but optical character recognition has been conducted on these slides. So Matterhorn has picked out the text on the slides, um, changed that into metadata, which is then searchable. So here someone searched for the word trade, and it's highlighting within the, um, highlighting within the player field where trade has been mentioned often in the PowerPoint files. So that largely fulfills my explanation of what Matterhorn is. Hopefully that's given you some level of understanding. James, do you want to, uh, to get your laptop ready? And uh, we'll do a software demonstration of an installation. I'll put these slides online afterwards so you don't have to write this all down. But I've added some useful links. So uh, basically encouraging you to try Matterhorn. It's free. You don't have to sign a license. You can, uh, the easiest way to get going with Matterhorn is, in fact, to do what James is about to do, create a virtualized uh, uh, server on your local desktop and do an installation. And there's mailing lists and an IRC channel, which means that you can ask questions. And, and the community is quite approachable. Um, oh, I think we might be losing batteries. Um, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so the community is quite approachable. So if you're trying to do a Matterhorn installation for your first time, you're interested in the technology, but it's not really working for you, then I'd strongly recommend that you, you, you approach the community. They're, they've got various channels in which you can do that. So what we'll do now is we'll move on to James. Um, Oh, it is still working. It's coming back. <laughs> James showing you a, a, a brief example of what it's like to deploy Matterhorn. Okay. All right. It's working. All right. I'm going to sit down for this because <laughs> I need to, I need to type, and my back will give up. Of course. <laughs> that it's there yet. Hey. Um, so what I'm going to do is something is a bit nerdy, um, is literally run through uh, this, the software installation, the installation of Matterhorn from source, since that, that's the, how the, how the uh, community currently uh, primarily delivers uh, Matterhorn, is that you actually download the source code and compile it uh, yourself. There are some people who are doing uh, packages, so you can download and look at them and try downloading and installing them. But uh, this is, at the moment, this is sort of the primary way of um, uh, getting hold of, of the software and, and, and running it for yourself kind of thing. So first thing to do is go to the Opencast uh, web website uh, and some recognisable faces up there. Uh, <laughs> you can see around, you can go and get their autograph um, kind of thing. So you scroll down and you go for the, you can see the Matterhorn project. So we'll just click on that. And it takes you to a, to a place where you can uh, tell you a bit more about the, the software in, in a way not, not as eloquent as uh, Stuart has just, just described it. <laughs> um, and then we can click on uh, download. Um, this actually takes you to a page with some links in it. Uh, and the most importantly of all is the install and configuration uh, page here. So we're just going to go to that. You can also go directly and look at the source code, release notes, and, other, and uh, also look at the previous releases. So um, we have just released 1.4, literally a couple, a couple of weeks ago. So um, we, a, lot of, a lot of hard work went into uh, getting to this point. Mm -hmm. So it takes, what it does, it takes you to the uh, JIRA 
uh, system that is, is the sort of where the development community hangs out kind of thing. It's basically a set of wikis. Um, it's a bug tracker, for a feature tracker for, for that Stuart was showing you before where we fixed, fixed issues in it. Um, and also the source code review and things like that. So it's, it's a sort of a development um, uh, source code management environment and stuff. But it also has the uh, documentation um, in it for, for Matterhorn uh, kind of thing. So uh, as Stuart's pointing out, Matterhorn's actually a, a number of components kind of thing. There's a core server um, that does the scheduling and um, in, ingests uh, suck, basically sucks up all the recordings from the capture agents kind of thing and does the processing for you. There's the engage part which actually uh, allows you to actually access the recordings and view the recordings from the distribution side. And there's also a separate, has its own capture agent as well which is separate, you can install separately and stuff which is what you inst install on your boxes that you put into your, your lecture theatres. Um, we, we don't use the Matterhorn capture agent at all. Uh, so we, we use, we use, we use Gallicaster because uh, it fulfilled the requirements that, that we wanted. So. so I'm just going to show you how the core server is, is uh, set up, basically. So we click on that, and it's a page which tells you about configuration and how to look after your, how do you look after your core server after you set it up. Um, but I'm going to look, click on the installation uh, page first. So there's ways to install it diff uh, for different um, types of platform. Um, it's not, it's, uh, you can cross compile it for Windows, uh, which means you build it on what, uh, not a Windows machine and then you can run it on a Windows machine. Um, but really you need to have access to uh, Linux hardware uh, primarily to uh, build and run um, Matterhorn. So I'm going to click on Linux which essentially is the installations for using uh, Ubuntu Debian flavoured uh, Linux. Okay, so what you see here is, is, is basically a set of instructions for uh, basically getting hold of the software, uh, building it and setting up some basic configuration to just get it up and running on, on your system. So I'm just literally going to run, run through this uh, process uh, for you live. So, <laughs> okay. So what I've got here is, is, is just a, uh, I've just got a, a virtual machine which is actually running on my desktop computer back in Manchester. But what it is, is, is a virtual machine. It's, um, it's a, 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 an Ubuntu 12.10 uh, installation and it's a, just a plain installation. It's nothing else that's been installed on here sort of thing. So I haven't done, I haven't done any other pre-configuration or anything um, like that uh, to it. Kind of thing. So I'm just going to be showing you how, how you, you run through and explaining some of the steps as we go along, uh, kind of thing. Um, I'm actually just going to cut and paste the commands in because my typing's awful and also it's what most people do anyway, we'll just cut and paste the commands. Uh, if I go, go back. All right. So I've switched the wrong page. Okay, so the first thing is make is to make a, a home for um, Matterhorn to live on on your system. Um, you need to have you have root, root access or sudo access to um, set set some of these things up. So that's what the sudo command is for. So um, okay. Right. So we can make a, a directory in a slash opt uh, called Matterhorn, and we're then going to sign it, make the ownership assigned to to our user, so they can access it and set it up and uh, play with it. So that's just the first that stage. Um, at the moment, um, Matterhorn source code exists in a subversion uh, resource uh, source code repository. So uh, one of the first things we need to do is actually install subversion, um, which allows us to actually uh, talk to the repository and uh, get hold of the source code um, directly. So we'll just paste that in. So, that, so I'm using Ubuntu, so I'm just using apt-get. So 
ask me if I want to say yes and continue. So it goes and pulls down the packages and installs that, that part of the software that we need to uh, access uh, Matterhorn. So the next part is actually to get hold of it from the repository. So we use a, uh, an SVN command to uh, essentially check out our own copy of the source code from Matterhorn. And uh, for the release notes and stuff, it tells you which specific version of, um, of Matterhorn that we want to get hold of, which is the latest release, which is 1.4. Um, so this, this is what kind of changes as new versions will come out, is, is this, uh, uh, which version we want to get hold of. So, so this now, if I go and pull down Matterhorn. So it's going to take a couple of minutes because it's, it's quite a large <laughs> package. Um, um, and uh, so I was going to leave it for run for a few minutes. So has anybody got sort of any, any questions about what I've done so far, or am I completely losing everybody? <laughs> <laughs> so in, this is sort of sort of standard way of the, how open source communities work, is that you, you can access the, the, the software by you know, the source code itself. So this is how we you know, get a hold of it to uh, make our own changes and make our own modifications uh, to it. And the, the subversion software allows us to put those changes back into the system um, as well so that other people can uh, get, get the benefits of our, uh, our efforts. So while we're, while we're waiting for it to install, do you have any other questions that are not necessarily code related? I'm quite happy to ask questions about what it's like to answer questions, to what it's like to use Matterhorn or how, how it's used practically. Or are we boring you to tears? <laughs> yeah, go on, Hector. Maybe I already know the answer, but some people could, could want to know the, the answer. How many people um, with which background does, does these people who has to have to deploy a, a, a medium level, I don't know, 20 capture agents, maybe more, to... How many people have to do it for, for you to get it working? So I, I guess 20 is a bit of a funny number because we, we've just done 10, and doing our first 10 took a lot of effort. And there's an odd scaling with Matterhorn, I think, when it comes to staffing. Where, um, so we have um, about 1.6 FTE in terms of development and ops, and it's uh, when you're talking about people with specific backgrounds, if you want to get the most out of Matterhorn, you probably need someone that knows some level of Java. You're talking about OSGI Felix, someone who's got some kind of experience about doing coding. Uh, because if you're doing Matterhorn, you really want Matterhorn because either uh, you want the cost advantages of not having a really onerous license, or it's because you want to deliver local customizations. So I think one of the challenging things is if you want to deploy 10 or 20 capture agents, you'd probably need that 1.6 FTE. Um, if, you're, if you're deploying 100, it's not actually that many more. Um, so like uh, the the, the Scaling of capture agents is not a linear relationship to the number of staff that you need. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a requirement to have the number of staff to work out the problems <laughs> that you're facing. It's not a, um, it's not necessarily a, a physical effort um, in, in terms of scaling of your um, of, of your, your deployment kind of thing. So, so you know the problems. That we, I still do a lot of the talks and stuff talking about the problems that uh, uh, that we had kind of things. And they were, you know, they weren't necessarily wouldn't necessarily be solved by more people. <laughs> I think when it also comes to development and um, uh, uh, scaling, so it's not just uh, James and my other developer Tobias that have worked on our system. Um, we realised pretty early on that if we wanted to do a large Matterhorn really fast, uh, and by large I mean 100 capture agents within a year, that we probably wouldn't be able to do that on our own. So it's been relatively cost effective for us to go to an external company that I've mentioned already, Entwine, and we contracted um, on a kind of time and materials basis their support in order to train our staff about how to deploy Matterhorn, in order to uh, kind of handhold us through the process of doing some of the rollout, because you know I just think it would have been naive for us to assume that we could just turn around, pick up a new software product, and then deploy it as a production environment within you know, probably less than 12 months. So, okay, I'll just quickly go on to the next stage and we can come back for some more questions then. Um, okay, so you might be aware that Matt Horn is actually a, a Java-based uh, uh, application, um, and uh, so you need to install a couple of things to, to get that working. One is the um, uh, Java development kit, um, 
specifically we're using the Open, open JDK version. Um, Matt Horn sort of runs on versions um, 1.6 uh, and 7 of, of, of Java, but um, I think as, as Oracle have just dropped support for Java 6, expect we'll be sort of making an effort to um, uh, properly support uh, version, version 7. Um, the other part that you need to install is, is Maven, which is basically uh, does all the hard work for you when it comes to Java in terms of uh, installing all the little bits and pieces and the extra libraries and things like that. It goes away, finds them for you, and, and, and downloads them, and, and also build, it's also the thing that builds, builds the project as well. Um, so I'm just going to copy these across. And I'll install Maven as well at the same time. So, yes, it's going to install lots of Java software for us. So, time for more questions. <laughs> okay, if, if anyone has any more questions, we're happy to answer them while it ticks away in the background. <laughs> so, I mean, oh. so the, okay. In the previous presentation, you have this this um, this architecture presenting the several components, and one issue was the um, the capture agent. So, and that you say that you remove it with uh, Galli casters. Uh, I guess Galli casters is also another piece of software that you uh, can replace instead of of the other one. So, how it works? Maybe if you can uh, if you can give some work uh, some information on that and also one other part was uh, at the uh, media at the servers you also have this red five and another swing uh, so if you could also based on these pictures so try to give some kind of practical uh, yeah, component that that you use I think could be help so to have a better ideas um, so to explain about the capture agents and how come there are different capture agents that work with Matterhorn, because normally, normally when you get a vended capture agent solution, it comes with just one capture agent, and, and that's what you use. Um, Matterhorn's got more than I've counted previously, um, and the reason for that is that Matterhorn uh, comes with a very flexible open API, so there's a um, there's kind of access area to... Um, uh, to the software if you're not familiar with APIs. But it's a, it's a standard way of laying out data um, f which you can look up online so you can find out how the API works. And you could go home and if you've got coding skills, you could write your own capture agent software. And if you're interested in making lots of money, you could maybe create your own hardware that would be customized that would run that software. So people like NCAST and Galacaster, they've gone away and they've looked at how the API works. And the API works by um, creating something called a media package. So if I were, once James's installation is finished, if I were to schedule a recording, what really happens is, is a folder is created with a set of instructions. Um, what the, the plan is that, that that folder says when the recording should be made, it contains unique information about that recording, the dates and times when that recording should run, and the plan is to eventually fill that, uh, that um, folder called the media package with a, with a video and some audio that will come from the lecture theatre. So in terms of making your own capture agent or using someone else's capture agent or using the Matterhorn capture agent, it's about sticking to the standards of that API, and because it's open and well documented, well documented. Um, it means that uh, it means that people can create their own unique agents. So, for example, uh, Epifan they have a very small capture agent, and they've they've used the the details of the API and created a proprietary set of code that sits on a customized piece of hardware, and you buy it as a package from them. Whereas um, Galacaster is um, uh, a combination of software. Galacaster is, is an alternate to the uh, capture agent, I would say, a piece of open source software that you can run on a Teltec branded hardware or you can run on your own hardware. And that little box over there is, is actually an example of the Manchester capture agent. So in summary, uh, the way that the capture agents work is they work with standard APIs and that's how we can have this kind of diversity within the, um, within the capture agent field. It's sort of similar when it comes to the, uh, the, the Red 5 stroke wowser stroke 
any other server, is that there's this customization instructions held within the wiki that accompanies um, Opencast Matterhorn, and it explains how instead of talking to the Red5 default streaming server, that you change a set of parameters within, uh, within Matterhorn, and those parameters say rather than pointing at the Red5 server, you point at an external server, you give it a username, you give it a password, and then that server, that, that, that's kind of like the API that allows, allows you to use different servers, and that's, that's kind of the modular architecture. With, uh, with the databases that I showed briefly, that's more about a database abstraction layer if you're familiar with it so the software works in a kind of standard function to one layer and then it, it obfuscates um, what is underneath it so that you can use uh, Microsoft SQL Server or MySQL or other variants uh, does that seem like a reasonable answer mm -hmm. yeah I'm ready I'm ready good so that, that was installed all the Java uh, packages and stuff so we're, we're getting ready to um uh, actually build Matterhorn. There's, we can first of all do some little bits of um, configuration um, for it, uh, just for a local um, install. Um, so we need to, ch it says in this instructions, there's a couple of things we, we may want to look at, uh, uh, which is the, giving it the correct URL, which is the name of your machine, um, and um, somewhere where you want to dump all the, all the recording data and all the other temporary files that um, Matterhorn um, uses. Um, so, to do all this, you just need somebody who's, you, you need to be or need to have, find somebody who's basically got some, you know, Linux experience, they're happy using the command line interface and happy to editing text files and you can get up, you know, a Matterhorn server up and, up and running. Um, for, for context on the level of, like, to, to do it properly for a production environment, you definitely need all of that. I think to try it for the first time, so I, I'm a former e-learning technologist, I'm now sort of an IT manager, but I used to work in um, e-learning, uh, and uh, I, I just tried this out for the first time because uh, I had very base level mm -hmm. Linux experience from you know, Unix <laughs> okay. type stuff from doing command line operations on Macs. And, uh, and then just applied the same techniques with Matterhorn to be able to, and I, was ma uh, I managed to get a, a, a VM up and running enough so that I could test it and take it for a bit of a test drive and figure out how it worked. Yeah, so basically the tagline for Matterhorn would be even Stuart can install it, um, <laughs> kind of thing. So you can type in here whatever the name of your, uh, your machine is, my machine's... Um, my machine's called Rhubarb. Okay, um, and we can also look for, for uh, let's type the storage in, so it can change where we want to store the storage. So um, on, a, on, a, on a system where you may have um, some um, a different, different folder for lots of storage, you can say um, install it into that, into that directory. Uh, I hate why. Something like that. Um, the two lines down below this are probably uh, most important for the second stage. We're not mm -hmm. going to demonstrate hooking up a capture agent to Matterhorn uh, today because um, my machine's back in the office and it's a bit complicated. Um, but here's the way you actually specify the uh, credentials that your capture agent will use to talk to the server kind of thing. So you can specify Matterhorn system account, and here it says uh, change me. So I, we suggest you use a random password generator or something like that. And then those are the credentials that go into the Gamacaster config or the, or the Matterhorn capture agent config or, or whatever, whatever that supports talking to, to Matterhorn. And then it, together with the, um, the URL that you've just given it at the t uh, further up, um, you serve the URL. Um, it's able to communicate uh, with, with Matterhorn. So you can right quit. Okay. So we finally get to actually build Matterhorn. Uh, we need to set some options uh, for Maven. These are just to do with uh, memory allocation because Matterhorn is a, quite a big project and the default settings are, are not quite enough uh, for it to get underway properly. And then we, I've already cd to that directory. So then we can give this Maven command, which just says do a clean install and then de where to deploy it. We want to deploy it into the same place where the source code is um, at the moment as well. Mm. 
Right. So what Maven will do now is basically look for all the configuration files in Matterhorn, and first of all, it will start downloading a whole lot of um, other Java files and Java uh, objects that are needed um, by, by Matterhorn. So this is what Maven does. It saves you having to go and find all these separate packages um, yourself. Um, but next time you come to build, if you rebuild uh, Matterhorn again, it probably won't need to download um, any files or very few files because it keeps a repository of the, all, these, uh, all the things that it's previously um, downloaded. This whole process, it will then start actually um, building uh, Matterhorn uh, proper. That whole process on a decent modern um, desktop PC takes about 20 minutes, half an hour kind of thing. So we're not going to sit here for that <laughs> length of time. <laughs> um, I'm just going to kill that and uh, exit. And I'm just going to shut this down. Quickly, and I had one I prepared earlier to quote a famous British cook. Um, so, once we've um, compiled uh, Matterhorn and everything's um, then okay, we can cd to the directory that we've installed it at and simply run the, the uh, command start Matterhorn from the bin directory. Uh, this will spew out a huge amount of information, uh, none of it which is particularly relevant as long as it all works. <laughs> And, and hopefully we can go to so this is running on my machine I've just started that running on my machine back in Manchester um, so it just comes up it comes up on this odd port number which is part of the way it's a Java application so they don't run on the standard um, uh, standard um, HTTP port number, um, so you have to specify this colon 8080 um, to actually uh, get taught to the uh, Java application, which is Matterhorn. So we then can log in. Um, it has a, it tells you the instructions. The standard login is admin, password is opencast. You can change that when you um, in that configuration file I, I showed you earlier. So that then takes you to a front page. Um, which shows you some of the components, the main components. You've got the administrative tools, which is this core, uh, uh, part of the core that we've talked about, and also the engaged tools, which is the um, distribution part. You have access to them separately. Um, it also gives you access to a lot of the document, some of the documentation, so the release notes again, which we've just seen, uh, the community lists, um, and also for developers, links into, into the wiki directly as well. Um, and also there's a the whole lot of um, documentation here for what are called the uh, REST API endpoints. Um, these are all ways of talking to, to Matterhorn uh, um, directly. Via, so you can use your own applications to talk and query Matterhorn, what's going on using, using these documentations. So you know, if you need to find a Java developer who knows about REST endpoints, and they will be able to use that to build you an application that can go and query how many, you know, what have I scheduled last week on, on Matterhorn and did those recordings succeed kind of thing. You can, using those documentations, uh, documents that are there, you can go and do that kind of thing. And then we can go to the, to the admin tools and this is what you see when you've got nothing recorded and stuff. So it's, we have an empty, uh, empty system. But essentially that's, what, that's the process that you have to go through um, to get it up, up and running. And then you can add, start adding your capture agents, which is a different, different uh, uh, process, uh, which we're not going to go through uh, today. OK, that's that, that well timed. You've finished with two minutes to spare. Yeah. Uh, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Otherwise, we'll call it a day. <laughs> we'll have to wake anybody up. <laughs> 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 Um, May one short question. You said you need like one year to replace the entire old system. So, so you had all the infrastructure like, like uh, microphones and anything like that already in the rooms, or because that, from my impression, when I started using it, the, at the, how do I knew how to set up? 
but then going into the field and trying to record something in the lecture hall just failed. So um, it's taking us a year to go from um, having an old system and I should move out of the way for that mm, a speaker. Um, it took us a year to go from having an old system to deploying up to a hundred capture agent. So that's that's kind of from August last year until the end of August this year. What we did over the winter was we deplace, replaced our existing system, which was only ten capture agents on Podcast Producer. So we started the replacement about mid December, and I think we finished. Um, in late January, um, so we obviously had some time off for the Christmas holidays, and I was short a developer due to his paternity leave. Um, uh, so, uh, so yeah, to re to replace the entire system took a bit over a month. So that uh, again, it wasn't just us on our own. Entwine were helping us. We were bugging the Galacastic community quite a lot. But um, but yeah, we we'd spent a period of time leading up to that, experimenting with different capture agents, trying to figure out what worked and what didn't. And for example, with the Matterhorn default capture agent, I'm not sure if that's what you were using, but I found that quite challenging. Um, and it... No, no, it was not the question about which capture agent to use, but it was like. It... I had some issues with like the microphones or getting the video signal and that stuff installed yeah. in the in the lecture room. And the question was, did you have that before yeah. starting choosing a lecture agent, or uh, yeah. was it also included in the year? So, so for those ten installations, um, there were already ten capture agents in which had audio signals and video signals going in. So it was just a matter of replacing one box for a different type of box. So that's why it's quite straightforward with us. You are right; it is quite challenging getting the microphoning in and getting the um, the AV signals, and that's what we're doing now. And that's a much longer project over the course of a year. We've identified, for example, half the locations we're going into don't currently have microphones. So, but we've got some budget to install microphones, and um, in many of them, they're 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 rooms much smaller than this, uh, so you wouldn't have people wandering back and forth. So we're using uh, USB boundary microphones attached to one of those boxes, and it's quite a simple, cost-effective method of going for it. The, and we're getting uh, AV signals by splitting the uh, projector feed at the front, similar to what's being done here today. Let's assume now uh, somebody have another uh, capturing agent or embedded in the hardware. How do you link that now uh, practically with these interfaces? So right. and do, uh, yeah, there's there's no, there's nothing to do in Matterhorn. Matterhorn um, does not talk to the capture agents. The, the capture agents talk to Matterhorn. It's it's this sort of guiding principle of how how it's been written, kind of thing. So. Um, it depends on which capture agent that you decide to deploy and stuff. You can deploy the, the capture agent that comes with, with Matterhorn, which is quite basic. It doesn't have a pretty user interface or anything like that. You have to go and type stuff into it. And stuff. Or you can use Galacaster, um, and you just have to edit some, um, a simple um, configuration file it's in plain text, and you put in the information that I've uh, pointed out, which is like the... Uh, URL of your service, the Matterhorn service that you're running, uh, and the credentials, the username and password. And then Galacaster will talk to uh, Matterhorn and say, hello, I'm here. And then it, when we can go to the um, list of capture agents, um, it will actually appear in there as, a, as, a, as an idle uh, capture agent, which you can now schedule against um, kind of thing. And even when you're scheduling, it still doesn't talk to the capture agent directly. The capture agent constantly requests uh, Matterhorn to send it what, what the schedule that it that it's been assigned kind of thing, um, so um, so it's 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 it's, it's a separate process as, uh, in that the capture agents uh, have to t talk to Matterhorn and their their configuration is all very individual depending on what what uh, unit you decide to go for. Okay. So we, we should probably call it a day there, so we're not eating someone else's time. But if you want to bug us with questions afterwards, feel free. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>